Yes, my name's Tim, and I'm going to talk to you today about GPS time, leap seconds, and a clock that's always right. How hard can it be to make a clock that's always right? Uh, well, obviously it's almost impossible, but uh, for some reason I gave it a shot anyway. Um, and I should say, I'm a hobbyist. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of people who know more about time and frequency measurement stuff than I do. Um, but, I mean, I'm not building a reference oscillator here. What I'm building is a wall clock. There's something that displays the time. Uh, you know, there's lots of newfangled optical clocks and atomic clocks and stuff. I'm not trying to build that. I just want, I just want to know what the time is. So, um, and I didn't set out to build a clock. It kind of happened by accident. Uh, yeah, as a kid, I was fascinated by seven-segment displays and didn't know what I wanted to make, but I wanted to build something. And then, as an adult, uh, yeah, that childhood dream was forgotten, and then one day I found out you can just buy seven segment displays for like 10p on eBay. So bought a whole load of them and started soldering them together, and I uh, didn't know what I was building, but built something. And then, uh, yeah, I don't think I knew what ISO 8601 or RFC 3339 were at the time, but uh, when I built the clock, I just, I just put the numbers in the order that made sense that is, descending order, right? It's like year, month, day, hour, minute, second, fraction fraction um, and yeah I later found out there's an entire group of people who uh, who promote the ISO 8601 date format um, there's, even, yeah, <laughs> there, there's an ISO 8601 subreddit so uh, uh, but at this at this point in time I didn't know any of that um, yeah I was, I was quite pleased with this little clock I built uh, it looks really cool right uh, like the dense soldering on the back of it it's like yeah I add a little control panel and uh, there's a little quartz oscillator uh, and what I had built was not a very good clock. Uh, it, you know, I wasn't trying to make a good clock. Uh, the quartz crystal would like, gain or lose a few seconds a day, and you can tune it by like, adding capacitors and stuff, but you know you get so far. And uh, the, the, uh, the amusing thing is, despite this, I, uh, I was interpolating the fraction of a second, so it read out to a hundredth of a second. It was ticking really fast, even though the time was like wrong. So uh, uh, I was oh, mentioning in common parlance, we use the terms precision and accuracy interchangeably, but in science and engineering, they do have different meanings. The canonical example is a, a dartboard. So if you're throwing darts at a dartboard and if they all hit the center, you're precise and accurate. If they are all over the place, but on average around the bullseye, then uh, you are accurate, but not very precise. If they're nowhere near, then you're neither. And if you have very tight grouping, but not on the bullseye, then you are precise, but not accurate. And that's the fun one. Uh, but precision can also mean significant figures. So that's things like 5.0001 is more precise than 5.0 or like 2 million pounds. Like if you, said, if you said something was 2 million pounds and the actual cost was 1p less than that, no one's going to call you out on that. But if you said the cost was 1 million, 999,999 and 99p uh, and then the actual cost was something different to that, that would just be really weird. So um, yeah, precision implies accuracy. And in the, well, at least in the absence of a tolerance, and the fact that my clock was reading out to 100 of the second, but could be several seconds out, was yeah, comedy gold. But for Mark II, it was time to make it accurate as well as precise. Uh, so what, what should we use as our time source? Well, there's, there's the radio control clocks. They use this low frequency signal. There's like there's 60 kilohertz from MPL. There's TCC, TCF 77 in Germany. There's WWVB uh, in the US and a bunch of other ones. And yeah, these, these are very accurate signals. Uh, there'll be a speed of light delay, if you care about that, like a millisecond or something, depending on how far away you are. Um, yeah, the long wave signals have good penetration through buildings. But uh, one reason I avoided this is that uh, electronically, it's, it's a little bit annoying to pick up a low frequency signal. It usually requires a physically large coil. And, uh, and also, like radio control clocks, in my experience, are just, they're just a bit rubbish. Uh, I, I have one I bought in this country, which picks up DCF77. and when you put the batteries in, you have to press buttons on it to tell it you're in the UK, so it subtracts an hour from Central European time. And we don't want that. So um, most people use their phones to get the time, right? Uh, and this is uh, via a protocol called NITS, and it's not very good. Uh, so it's, it's basically the, the uh, provider, the broadcast, the, the cellular provider broadcasts the time from the cell towers, and they might have set it accurately or they might not. And, uh, the, you know, it, it has an advantage that if you go abroad, right, and you connect to you, the roaming cell towers, and it will tell you the local time, 
uh, assuming your phone supports that frequency, but uh, I mean, like, let's get real. I'm not going to put a GSM modem and a SIM card on my clock. You know, it's just, I'm not going to do that. Um, there's, yeah, there's NTP, uh, which is what desktop computers use, uh, network time protocol, and I'm not going to put an internet connection on the clock. I'm not going to have an internet of clocks. It's not allowed. And besides, like, most NTP servers, or like the straight from zero servers, most of them just listen to GPS, right? Uh, because GPS, as a time source, is like the best. Um, uh, the way that satellite navigation works is just by uh, measuring the differences between very, very accurate time pulses. And uh, so anything that has a GPS receiver automatically has a really accurate time source. And it's kind of amusing that phones have a GPS receiver and don't use it. Um, yeah, you, you can buy a GPS module for less than a fiver, and it will give you a time pulse that's like accurate to within 50 nanoseconds, which is just insane. Um, and the best possible clock you can have as a hobbyist, really, is a GPS disk with an oscillator, which, uh, yeah, the GPS signal will bounce around a bit with the weather, but uh, if you have a local oscillator for short term stability and then you discipline it to GPS, then you'll have just a really good oscillator. Um, GPS. I forgot to make that animated GIF. GPS is maintained by the United States Space Force. Uh, it, it was renamed uh, in the Trump administration. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, every GPS satellite has a bunch of atomic clocks on board. And then there's some really, really good atomic clocks at ground level, uh, which they use to resync them. Uh, they didn't just put the satellites up in orbit and forget about it. It has to be constantly monitored and adjusted. Uh, yeah, if you want to find your location to within a few meters, then you need to know where the satellites are to within like a few centimeters. And uh, the orbits aren't perfect circles. There's all kinds of effects going on that like cause them to drift. And uh, there's a team of people round the clock monitoring and correcting the satellite information. So uh, it's a very hard problem to solve. Uh, if, if the signal you get from the satellite is not what you expect, is that because the satellite has moved or is it because the clocks on board have drifted? How do you tell? It's quite tricky to know. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of satellite navigation systems. Um, they're all very, very expensive. Uh, GPS costs the US government around $2 billion a year uh, to maintain, and Galileo costs 10 billion euros to build. Uh, and even though Galileo is much newer than GPS, uh, when they came to design it, they basically just copied GPS because like, uh, GPS did it so well. Um, and I want to mention uh, Bert Hubert. They gave a talk at MCH, which is very good. If you want to know the nitty-gritty nitty details about uh, uh, navigation systems, and he made, he made this website called galmon.eu, which in real time shows you all of this stuff about uh, all of the navigation satellites in real time. Really cool stuff if you're interested in that, so check that out. But for us, we're going to buy a very cheap GPS receiver, and it will give us a PPS time pulse, which tells you, well, the rising edge of the PPS tells you the start of the second. Um, and then it also has NMEA, NMEA serial data. Uh, and somewhere hidden in that will be an RMC message, which tells you the important things, which is your position, your speed, uh, your, and what it thinks the UTC timestamp was at the start of the last pulse. Uh, and it's interesting that it tries to give you UTC, because you, uh, and sometimes fails, because GPS does not use UTC. GPS uses... GPS time, which is currently 18 seconds ahead of UTC. <laughs> uh, and this is because GPS time was aligned to UTC in January 1980, uh, and since then we've had 18 leap seconds. So GPS time does not have leap seconds, and they've drifted apart. Um, the module, the cheap ones, will listen just to the L1 signal from the satellites, and this has yeah, it's got a 1.5 gigahertz carrier signal, it's got a symbol rate of 1 megahertz, and a data rate of 50 bits per second, and that ratio of 50 to 1 million is what gives it this like, incredible signal recovery. Uh, if you look at the data sheets for GPS module, like this one, can track a satellite at a received signal strength of minus 167 dBm. I'm like, that's just madness. Like, and if you don't know what dBm is, it's, it's really, really small, that number. So. Um, yeah, uh, because of this low bit rate, they have to be very terse messages, can't waste bandwidth. And the way GPS time is broadcast is a 10-bit weak number and then a 19-bit time of weak number, which is essentially the number of seconds into the week. And the time is broadcast with each frame, uh, but the leap second offset is only broadcast once per message, so that's to get to UTC from GPS time. It's only broadcast, well, it, it, it's every 12.5 minutes, it's uh, every 25 frames. So, um, 
yeah, with our GPS module warming up, it's, it's quite often it will have a really, really accurate time pulse that's exactly off by a few seconds, uh, which is interesting. Uh, why do we have leap seconds? Well, um, yeah, up until the mid 20th century, we, uh, the definition of a second was just uh, 60 times 60 times 24, uh, so 86,400 seconds in a day. So it's just, um, yeah, uh, divide a day into 86,400, but like, what is a day? Noon to noon? Well, noon is the only point you can measure accurately or unambiguously like uh, when the sun is highest in the sky, right? I think. Um, but even if you measure the time between noon and noon on uh, subsequent days, it won't be exactly 24 hours because you've got the seasons, you've got the, the, the Earth being a not quite perfect circle and uh, the orbit not being a circle and uh, yeah, the inclination of the Earth. Uh, it's called the equation of time. And basically, okay, if we, if we average noon to noon throughout the whole year, we end up with mean solar time and that is that is the, the 24 hours that get divided to get this number. Uh, and yeah, an apparent noon can differ from uh, mean time noon uh, by up to 16 minutes. Um, yeah, mean solar day. Uh, and this is, this is where the term mean in Greenwich Mean Time comes from. But um, Greenwich Mean Time is a, a loaded term now because it's not used to mean the mean solar time at the Greenwich Meridian, Meridian anymore. Uh, the modern equivalent is called universal time, uh, which is, uh, oh yeah, MPL carefully avoid ever mentioning uh, GMT, even though it is officially the time zone in winter in the UK. Um, but yeah, universal time is UT1, and this is it's, uh, like the definition is like Earth's rotation angle it's linked to. Um, and NPL, in their 60 kilohertz broadcast, they, they tell you UTC and UT1. And if you're trying to do anything scientific, UT1 is basically useless because uh, by definition, the length of a second changes. Like um, you know, when we invented atomic clocks, we realized that uh, yeah, the Earth is not a very regular uh, rotation rate. Uh, there's things like tidal friction. Um, and so if the Earth slows down, your seconds get longer, which is useless. So uh, we invented yeah, I already said that. We invented uh, international atomic time. So this is when atomic clocks, and we we got the SI second, which is a fixed length. Hooray! Um, however, the Earth is slowing down and speeding up, so uh, atomic time and universal time drift apart. And the solution to this was UTC. Um, so UTC uses fixed length SI seconds. It's currently 37 seconds behind uh, atomic time. Uh, and we insert or remove, technically, uh, leap seconds to keep UTC in sync with UT1. Uh, so let's just be clear, uh, not many people wanted leap seconds. Uh, physicists definitely didn't want leap seconds. Engineers didn't want leap seconds. General public didn't care. The only people who, who wanted leap seconds were politicians, right? Um, and I've come to realize that when it comes to time standards and time zones, uh, it's all very, very political. Uh, uh, leap seconds themselves are hilarious. Uh, so the, the number of problems caused by leap seconds is uh, ridiculous. Uh, what have we got? Yeah, to, during a leap second, uh, clocks read 60. The Unix timestamp freezes because POSIX defined a day to be exactly 86,400 seconds, uh, not 86,401. Uh, so during a leap second, the Unix timestamp just reads the same as the previous value. Uh, like. Google, in their infinite wisdom, decided to smear leap seconds. So that is, instead of having a jump, you, over 24 hours, slowly adjust the clocks, which, you know, that would be one way of doing it if everyone did it, but not everyone does it, so, like, NTP is going to fight. It's just silly. Um, yeah, uh, that's a bunch of problems. That, there's loads of problems related to leap seconds, but um, for various reasons, in the last few years, the, uh, the Earth has been speeding up. So um, it might have something to do with global warming or you know, ice caps melt. Nobody really understands. There's some complex interactions uh, going on to do with angular momentum. But for some reason, the Earth has been speeding up lately. And at the current rate, we might have to have a negative leap second. We've never had one of those before. Uh, they always were possible. Um, but since we've never had one, the, the prospect of one means that uh, the people in charge have recently decided that they might just abolish leap seconds as of 2035. But where this starts to get funny is that leap seconds cause problems when they don't happen. So uh, 
Yeah, the Earth is speeding up. Uh, last leap second was in 2016. And uh, yeah, um, well, the reason for this is, uh, yeah, so there's several. I'll, I'll show you one of the issues. It's basically GPS time is broadcast as a 10-bit uh, weak number, so it rolls over every 19 years. And uh, this particular issue was the author made an assumption about how many leap seconds we would have uh, by, uh, well, 2021. And uh, because we haven't had enough leap seconds, suddenly it was going to roll back uh, 20 years or 19 years. Um, yeah, there, there were other glitches as well because the actual leap second, the time when the leap second happens is broadcast as an 8-bit weak number. And uh, yeah, that, so that rolls over every five years. And so like twice we've had a five-year period without a leap second, I think. And yeah, loads of bugs happen when that happens. Um, and also it, it, it's hit the real world. I found a news article called Honda Clocks Are Stuck 20 Years in the Past, which uh, doesn't explicitly mention leap seconds, but I'm pretty sure that this is uh, related to the absence of leap seconds. So, hilarious. Um, but yeah, it turns out making a clock that's always right is really difficult. So let's get back to the main story. Um, we have a GPS module. Uh, it's giving us a, a pulse, and it's got serial data that tells us uh, what the time was at the previous pulse. So, uh, we only know the time, like a few hundred milliseconds after the pulse, and in order to display the correct time, we need to add one to it. And that means our clock needs to implement the entire logic of the clock. So if, if the time comes in and it says it was uh, one second to midnight on the 31st of December, then we need to display, we need to roll over to the next year. Uh, or if it's the 28th of February, we need to check, is it a leap year, is it going to be the 29th of February, or is it the 1st of March? Um, and because the data was coming in in ASCII, uh, and the uh, data going out was a decimal rep representation, uh, for some reason I decided to do all of the logic in BCD, that is binary coded decimal, and I performed the entire rollover logic within the interrupt routine and uh, some very tightly optimized assembly code. And uh, yeah, uh, so fine, simplifying this a lot. Um, we're interpolating the hundredth of a second, it's always ticking between each pulse, and we need to discipline that to the GPS signal. So, um, and the GPS signal may not even be present, because if it loses fix, uh, so we need to set up a, a, like a, like a phase lock loop. And um, finally, anyway, skipping ahead, finally got to this point where I've got, this is the Mark II and the Mark III clock, and uh, there's no communication between them. Uh, they both independently found the time from GPS, and they're displaying it to within a millisecond, or they're displaying to a hundredth of a second, but uh, it's ticking to within a millisecond, which is pretty cool. And the time is finally right, uh, except that was during winter, and when summertime came around, and when it got to summer, uh, the clock changed, and my clock was wrong, so we had to implement daylight saving time. Uh, so, doing all of this in uh, binary coded decimal, BCD, um, within the interrupt routine, we can add an hour to the time, uh, but knowing when to add that hour is a bit of bit more tricky because uh, okay, it's the last Sunday of March, the last Sunday of October, uh, so that's different dates of the year each year. So I, I made a script to pre-calculate them. I just loaded up the next hundred years of uh, what the dates are and just hard-coded it into the clock. Uh, right, and uh, that, okay, I should say at this point, um, a couple of people had seen my clocks. So they were asking if they could buy them. I was like, sure, maybe I could try selling it as a kit. Suddenly. I need to support other time zones, and as people in the U.S. asked, so that in the U.S. the daylight saving they're still in the Northern Hemisphere, but their daylight saving is just slightly different. Second uh, Sunday of March. Oh, uh, yeah. And um, what's even more ridiculous about daylight saving in the U.S. is that they switch at local time, not UTC. Everywhere in Europe switches at 1 a.m. UTC. In the U.S., for just one hour per year, Chicago clocks read the same as New York. Great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very stubborn, so I went through all, well, started to go through all of the time zones. We've got like India and Nepal, like five hours 30, five hours 45, you know, politics. Um, uh, all of this was done in BCD, in assembly. It was very tedious. Uh, yeah, there's loads of weird time zones in Australia. Like, this one town in Australia has their own time zone. Uh, all of this, this is some of the source code, is just a load of defines where I just started like progressively adding these one at a time as, as and when necessary. Uh, yeah, New Zealand was a real chore, so obviously daylight saving is inverted in the southern hemisphere. Uh, but uh, yeah, in New Zealand, it's, it's the, the first Sunday of April. So if the first Sunday of April 
lands on the first of the month, then the UTC date that we're starting with is in a different month because they're 12 hours ahead. So it, it was mind-bending and, and tedious. Uh, uh, and it wouldn't really have been that much a problem if we weren't doing it in BCD uh, in, in assembly. So I got to like 95% coverage of all of the time zones. Uh, and the point where I actually drew the line was a place called Lord Howe Island, which has a population of less than 400. And during daylight saving time, they move their clocks forward by half an hour. Like, <laughs> I said, no! Uh, now, there is, there is something called the Olsen time zone database. Uh, but the, the, well, the thing is, at times, there is no central authority. Every government is free to make up whatever they want. Uh, and it's amazing things are even as coherent as they are. Um, yeah, the closest thing we have to an authority is this database, the time zone database. Uh, it's unofficial, but everyone uses it. Uh, every operating system, every phone uses this database. Uh, a lot of people have misconceptions about time zones and, and how complex they are, so I should point out that the time zone database has over 500 different zones in it. Um, I, and I, I strongly recommend just reading the database, because even though it's called a database, it's mostly prose. You'll get like 10 paragraphs of the history of this zone and then one line of data. So like really, if you haven't looked at it, do read the time zone database. It's really interesting. Um, uh, so I made this decision that when it comes to designing the Mark IV clock, that's this one, uh, I would start over and use the time zone database. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so more importantly, on the Mark III clock, we had to set the time zone manually, uh, which, given that we've got a GPS receiver, seems a bit ridiculous. Um, I mean, people kept asking, how can I have GPS and not know where it is? Uh, which is like it's, it's a simple question, isn't it? Really. Um, well, getting your time zone from GPS position is a solved problem, uh, at least on desktop computers. Uh, the first thing we need is a map of the whole world. Uh, so, yeah, we found one. There's Time Zone Boundary Builder is a project which extracts a shape file from OpenStreetMap data, and uh, yeah, there's a bunch of reference implementations on how to make use of this data. One of them is written in C. It's called Zone Detect. And uh, if we run this on a desktop computer or server, it, it works, right? Uh, and in theory, all we have to do is port this to a microcontroller. Uh, yeah, but we're, we're dealing with a lot of data here. This, this is big data for a clock. Um, time zone database, I, I compressed it to half a megabyte. Uh, shape file for the map, 11 megabytes. I mean, uh, to be clear, the, the Mark III clock was using an 80 tiny chip, which had two kilobytes of program memory and uh, 128 bytes of RAM, which, like, that's, that's an appropriate amount of RAM for a clock, I feel. <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, you know, we could just stick a Raspberry Pi on it, but I, I don't want it to be a Raspberry Pi. I, don't, I mean, I don't want it to run Linux, uh, and we'd probably have to add another microcontroller just to get the timing right for the display. I, I don't want to do that. It's not going to have a Raspberry Pi. We're going to do this properly. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, the first thing Zone Detect does is it, it runs MMAP to just map the whole thing into RAM. So yeah, we need some changes. Um, I chose an STM32 chip, uh, and I gave it an, a 16 megabyte external flash memory chip. Um, yeah, I had to rewrite loads of Zone Detect to get it to talk to the memory chip and not load it into RAM. And I made a fully custom display, which uh, has extremely low dish jitter. Uh, but, and the key thing is I made it double buffered. Uh, there's a picture of the chip. Uh, yes, uh, so yeah, w when the time reads 0. Point, you know, if you imagine the course of a second, you've got zero through to the rollover. At about 0. 0.5, you get enough data from the serial data to know what the time should be. And then at about 0. 0.9, that's when I start preparing what the display should read at the next rollover. And so you can take you know, hundreds of milliseconds if you want, or 100 milliseconds in that case, uh, to work out what the time should be. And then you store it in memory. And then when the pulse comes in, you just swap the buffers. And I should have done that to begin with. It's so stupid that I didn't. Um, yes, uh, so this is the Mark, clock, Mark 4 clock. Uh, and when I designed this, I tried to incorporate every possible feature request I'd ever had, uh, probably too many to list. Uh, so first thing is the display doesn't flicker when filmed at high speed. Um, uh, yeah, the time zone updates as you carry it across country borders. I, I've got there. Uh, yes, the precision progressively reduces if it loses GPS signal. So this matches the accuracy. So one of the 
one of the main problems I wanted to solve was if the time is not right, it can demonstrate that by just dropping digits off the end, which is very satisfying. Um, oh yeah, because I because it's now reads the millisecond, uh, it was getting wider and wider, and people said the clock was too wide, so um, <laughs> falls in half. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Another big problem is uh, firmware updates, because the Time Zone database updates all the time. It's like 10 times a year. The, the country borders do change. There's a USB port, and there's, there's just a, a, a beautiful bootloader that I've written. It's, it's just it's a, it's a work of art. The, probably m m more effort than anything else went into making the bootloader for this clock. It's, just, it's, it's so good. Um, and like, it gives priority to this, the display over the USB interrupts, so it doesn't flicker as you're copying files onto it. It's, it's, it's important. Um, and there's, there's loads more features, which I probably shouldn't list all of them, but um, yes, uh, yeah, lots of other stuff. Um, that's pretty much the end of the slides. I was going to say, it's not for sale. I wanted to maybe sell it at some point, but um, very easily distracted. In the lounge, I've got an XL clock, which is twice the size, and an XXL clock, which is twice the size of that. Uh, and I was just I was going to finish up the talk by saying, um, if you know the right people, or if you ask nicely enough, uh, quite a lot of people who have very high-speed cameras are willing to let you borrow them. So I've got some footage uh, on this. So what are we going to... Here we go. Uh, that's, so this is the clock filmed at 14,000 frames a second on a Phantom Flex uh, 4K. And yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It ticks. It's really ticking. We did it. <laughs> like, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it turns out the highest resolution you can get on a Phantom Flex 4K is 25,000 frames per second, but this will be flicker free to well above that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, also I have some other footage which happened more recently, which was um, uh, a guy named Gavin has access to some very high-speed cameras, and he asked me what was, what, how many digits could we stick onto the end of this clock, and uh, yes, All right. it's not built yet, but we have, okay, this is, this is one digit ticking at 100,000 frames a second, uh, which is quite fast, but that particular camera, uh, can go up to just mad frame rates. This is, this is filmed at 1.7 million frames a second. And this proves that the, the digits can work at that speed. So maybe for the Mark V, we're going to just keep adding more digits, more precision. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that's, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, I can talk a lot more about this clock if you want, but I think it's probably a good place to stop. Uh, yeah, thank you.